thank you for joining us. The Jewish National Fund has evolved into a global environmental leader by planting 240 million trees, has built over 210 reservoirs and dams, and developed over 250,000 acres of land and 1,000 parks. The Jewish National Fund has provided the infrastructure for over 1,000 communities and has brought life to the Negev Desert and is also educating students around the world about Israel and the environment. Richard is on assignment in Atlanta, and one of the interviews he conducted there was with the legendary Israeli singer Shuli Natan. Her singing career is like a fairy tale. She was only 20 years old and unknown when asked to sing a new song at the 1967 Israeli Song Festival. And only two weeks later, with the breakout of the Six Day War, her song, Jerusalem of Gold, became the greatest Israeli hit song ever. We'll hear more about the Jewish National Fund and Shuli Natan. Here in southern Israel at the Arava Institute for Environmental Studies, Israeli, Palestinian, Jordanian, and international students all get the chance to live and study together, using the environment to build relationships across the lines of conflict. So what brought all of you here to Arava? I can't, I can't even imagine if I didn't come here what my perspective will be. The people are living with me, Israelis, we have also Palestinians, Jordanians, and we all share the same things. Like, I put the conflict aside, it's like there's nothing conflict, we are all humans. It's not, it's not, there's, on the other side, it's not the enemy anymore. And how did you guys feel when you came here and, and you were able to meet Palestinians and Jordanians and find that you had so much in common? How did it change your perspective of what's happening here in the region? It's what I'm looking for. And it's part of creating a future. As soon as I heard about it, I understood it's an amazing place. And my parents live in the Golan Heights here in Israel. Yeah, it's the environment. It doesn't matter what nationality you're from. It's the same language, it's nature. It was a good thing, because here you can express yourself and you can make the people around you feel with you. you feel your suffers and you feel your pains. So that was a good experiment for me. I'm from Nablus, Palestine. Uh, some of the people think that it is bad, it's not good to deal with Israeli people. We have a conflict and we have a war, we have uh, uh, in this region. But actually, uh, even if they think that I'm doing what I believe in and what I feel it is good for me. What I find truly inspirational is that in this land of walls and guns, the study of water and the environment reveals a shared humanity that is being translated into life-changing friendships between people from all sides of the conflict. Water is maybe a reason for the unity or maybe a reason for conflict. I think here it is a good, a good chance for us as a Palestinian and Israeli people and Jordanian also we are here in the same place talking about the same scarcity, which is water, water resources in the future. Well, there's a message that you'll see on, on, uh, on our shirts uh, that says nature knows no boundaries, nature knows no borders. And here we have uh, Israelis and Palestinians, and there's no signed, declared peace between Israel and Palestine. And, I so want there to be, but this is, this is a seed, you know, it's happening here. How about you, Gabriel? How do you see the environment as a way to bring people together, to start building bridges that can lead to cooperation and, and diplomacy and eventually maybe even peace? You know, first we should make the, uh, the connection of water for everybody, food for everybody, and realize that it's, it's all one system. The Earth is just one system, no matter where we draw the fence lines then we can understand that we're all one. We came to the Middle East to understand how a thirst for water could bring people together in spite of ancient rivalries. And the people we met in Jordan, Israel and Palestine all recognize that water knows no borders and that our common future depends on this precious resource. 
With us now is David Weisberg, Executive Director of Friends of the Araba Institute in Israel. David, it's a real pleasure to have you on the show. It's good to meet you. Thank you for having me here. My pleasure. Did I get your title correctly? Uh, absolutely, you got my title correctly. Great. Well, tell our audience a little bit about what your institute is doing and why it's so critical at this time in history. Sure. I'm Friends of the Araba Institute was formed um, about 15 years ago. Uh, and built on the notion that nature knows no borders, that while the people of the Middle East have a lot of things that make them different, uh, different religion, different politics, different culture, that they have one thing that they share in common and they have no choice about that. They share the same environment, they share the same environmental problems, and they live in an area where everyone's packed so close together that they can't solve those problems if they don't learn how to cooperate. And so that's what we do. We bring young future environmental leaders, uh, Israelis, Palestinians, Jordanians, all together to live and work and study the environment together on one campus as a way to build the type of trust and respect and understanding that will help advance not only uh, environmental sustainability, but hopefully ultimately be a building block towards coexistence. David, that's quite fascinating. The thought of bringing people together because they understand the mutual challenges facing the region and using these facts I think it's just a, a wonderful a concept in maybe opening people's eyes and creating cooperation. Tell us a little bit more about how that sector of the Middle East population, the more intelligent individuals, understand this. How is that? I, I don't know that I'd call them more intelligent, maybe more enlightened. Um, and you know, I think that the environment uh, can play a special role in bringing people together. I mean, the, the reality. Uh, and uh, you know, our students will say this, is if, you know, if we don't make sure that there's enough you know, water to drink, then what's the point about fighting over the land in the first place? It, it won't be livable. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that, that what, what the environment does and the special role that it plays uh, is it creates this imperative uh, that even when, uh, you know, even during times of conflict, uh, when other folks are running to their own quarters, uh, that our students understand uh, that unless they continue to work together, uh, you know, there'll be no land that anybody can live in. Um, and I think what we're seeing 15 years into the program uh, is we're beginning to see our alumni now going back to their home communities and their home countries and trying to work on the types of projects across borders that are beginning to really improve the quality of life of people in the region. And, and what I think will, will happen in time is that even those who aren't necessarily inclined towards coexistence, towards uh, you know, so-called normalization, will be able to say, you know what, well, I might not be interested in that. If working together improves my quality of life, then it creates this imperative where I should try to cooperate across borders as well. Well, is it actually working? Uh, are the number of students and individuals who are becoming enlightened, as you say, are they having an influence on a their... A abs absolutely. You know, right now it's, it's not a, a huge number of students. We have a, a small program we've had. 600 alumni, but these are you know 600 people who wouldn't be working together and wouldn't be influencing their friends and families and others without the benefit of this program. I'll give you a you know a very small anecdote. One of our uh, alumni is now employed as the associate director of the Israeli governmental company that oversees management of the Dead Sea, and there's all kinds of problems with the Dead Sea disappearing. And his boss called him into the office one day and was. You know, lamenting the fact that he couldn't work with his counterpart in Jordan and said, you know, how much better would it be if we could talk together and we could communicate? And this alum said, you know, hold on a second. And he pulled out his cell phone. He called one of his fellow alumni from Jordan. And a couple hours later, his boss and his counterpart in Jordan were talking to each other. And that you know, simple kind of communication is the type of thing that doesn't happen outside of the context of a place like the Aravai Institute that's building these type of trusting relationships. In what language is this training taking place? All of, all of the classes at the Institute are taught in English. It's the, the most universal language. And you know, we have a student body that's typically made up of one-third Israeli Jews, one-third Arab-speaking students, whether Palestinians, Jordanians, or um, you know, Arab Israelis, and one-third students from everywhere else in the world, primarily North America, but. You know, Europeans, South Americans, Australians. Well, I would, I would think your program serves as a wonderful example of how academia and common sense can be implemented in advancing the cause of peace. Tell us a little bit more 
about your thoughts on that. Maybe similar programs could take place in other areas, not necessarily the environmental. No, no, absolutely. I, I, you know, first of all, I think that we're a model in terms of uh, the environmental work that we do on a cooperative basis and the notion that um, these types of programs that are meant to bring people together are most effective when there's a practical outcome. It's not just about bringing people together to talk about making peace, but it's doing something together that perpetuates that relationship. Uh, but in fact, we're not the only organization in Israel that's bringing together people to build these types of relationships. We're one of many, whether it's bringing people together through you know, business or through high tech or through soccer or through theater. Uh, you know, we think any of these types of examples that bring people together uh, based on um, you know, uh, shared interests. David, environmental concerns are not limited, unfortunately, to Israel alone. Unfortunately, it's a problem worldwide and something that the, everyone in the world should be concerned with more than so many other trivial things they are obsessed with. So I admire what you're doing. Tell us how you see the challenges facing environmental concerns globally in general. Sure. Well, I mean, the, the types of issues that we focus on at the Arava Institute are the issues uh, facing the Middle East, uh, water scarcity, air quality, um, uh, sustainable agriculture, renewable energy. Uh, but what we find quite clearly is you know, the issues that we're facing aren't issues that are only faced in the Middle East. They're issues that are faced around the world. So, you know, for example, we've been invited on a number of occasions to provide uh, seminars on transboundary water management uh, where we bring a, a Palestinian and a Jordanian and an Israeli researcher to present a seminar in you know, Los Angeles or in Salt Lake City or in uh, Boulder, Colorado because uh, they face their own kind of transboundary water issues there, maybe not you know, international but uh, across state lines or across county lines. Uh, and they want to learn from what's going on at the Aravai Institute. Um, certainly the things we're doing in our sustainable agriculture department uh, have an effect that's, uh, uh, that's on a global level. Uh, in um, uh, recent years, um, the uh, uh, Israeli uh, Foreign Service Agency has used the Aravai Institute to provide training in agricultural techniques to representatives from Africa and from uh, Southeast Asia. And, uh, and clearly the things that we're doing in renewable energy uh, have a global impact, whether doing projects to create biodiesel from agricultural waste or uh, a pioneering project we're doing now uh, in terms of, uh, of hydrogen-powered vehicle technology. What about the dead med concept? Uh, well, um, the, the dead med concept uh, isn't really um, what's on, on the table at this point. What uh, folks are looking at is the proposed uh, Red Sea to Dead Sea conduit. Uh, and uh, just to provide a little bit of context on that, uh, it's a project that's being developed to really address two major issues. Uh, one is that the Dead Sea is disappearing. It's dropping in water level by about a meter a year. Hotels that were built to be on the shore of the northern basin of the Dead Sea now need trams to take their guests to the Dead Sea. Uh, and at the same time, most Palestinians and most Jordanians don't have running water seven days a week. They get a spigot turned on once a week, they fill up uh, a water tank, and that's the water they have to use because there's a, a really grave water shortage in that area. And so the idea of the Red Sea to Dead Sea conduit is to pump water from the Red Sea to the Dead Sea to use the tremendous drop in altitude to generate hydroelectric power, which would run a giant desalination plant which would split the water into potable, into drinkable water that would go primarily to Jordan and to the West Bank. And the remaining brackish water, the heavily salty water, would go to the Dead Sea to begin to raise the water level there. Uh, the World Bank has commissioned uh, a feasibility study of this project. And as part of that feasibility study, they needed to do an environmental impact assessment. And who did they look to to do that environmental impact assessment? They looked to the Aravai Institute. And so that's something that our faculty um, and our graduate students have been working on and is nearing completion. Uh, and once that whole feasibility study is done, we'll see if a, a Red Sea to Dead Sea conduit actually happens. Isn't it fascinating how innovation and intelligent solutions can bring such hope for a better future, a brighter future for our world in general, for all peoples? This is really very fascinating. and. Um, very pleased to have had you on the show. We have to have you on again, and we have to visit you in the, in the Negev one of these days, bring your crew down there and see 
firsthand what you're doing. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having us on. Thank you, sir. I'll be right back. With us now is legendary Israeli singer Shuli Natan. Shuli, it's a privilege and an honor to have you on the Shalom Thank Show. Thank you. Shuli, it was such a pleasure seeing you so many years ago singing Jerusalem of Gold in Israel after the uh, Six Day War. And um, it's, it's a part of Israeli history that is so close to my heart, that period, the good old days. And uh, mm-hmm. I'd like to ask you, how do you feel being here in America singing Yerushalayim Shel Zahav again? It's a pleasure. I do come quite often to the United States and, uh, and I sing. I sing here, yes. It is said of you that you are like an ambassador of Israel from a musical sense. Not only do you sing songs, uh, the classics and so forth that you have presented, but also that you, the stories you tell, the explanations you provide add another asset of imagery to your songs. Tell a little bit about the Hasbara role, the informational role you're playing for Well, Israel. I don't, uh, I didn't think it uh, really, uh, I didn't think about it too much. I just to de- uh, like to deliver my love uh, to my country. And uh, I guess I do it through stories, stories of the second Aliyah, of people who came here and built with their raw hands this country, great people. What are your favorite songs? Uh, I like traditional songs, religious songs. Uh, I like Naomi Shemer very much and identify with her. And uh, I do sing a lot of her songs and traditional songs. I would sing songs in Yiddish, in Ladino, Spanish Jewish uh, language and other uh, uh, prayers from different uh, communities, Iraqis, Moroccans. I like the whole spectrum of Hebrew songs. And they are so powerful. I would say they're so powerful. The power of music is interesting. Music can make people cry, laugh, be stimulated in different areas. Very important. When I emigrated to Israel, I remember being so impressed with uh, the folk songs on the the stages on Yom Atzmaut, Israel's Uh Independence Day, with the accordions. It was really wonderful, the power of music, very inspiring. So how do you see the challenges facing Israeli Hasbara, promoting a better image of Israel? How do you feel uh, the importance of that is today, more or less than in the past? I think it's very important. It's important to show, to show the world uh, our good side. Uh, it's important also that we try and uh, strive together with the Palestinians to, to come to a resolution of living together at peace on this land which we both love and uh, I hope this will bring prosperity. Hopefully peace will come soon to our doorstep. Well, uh, uh, this is a hope that everybody in Israel has expressed forever in 60 something years. And of course it takes two to tango as they say in America and I would hope that it will be reached. Yes, uh, we have to be patient because uh, Things like that do take their time. And you, you know about Ireland for hundreds and hundreds of years, there was this conflict and one day it just ended. And I do hope for us too, that one day it will just end. Of course, that uh, would be the hope of so many people and beneficial to everybody in the Middle East. There's so for much sure, more there. there will be such prosperity Again, so much in the more. Middle East. There's a cooperation of both people. What do you see as the challenges facing Israel and Jewish life in general in the future? Um, Maybe we started as a social democratic uh, country. I think we have to remember that we have to take care of our citizens, the ones who have less than others and not uh, deepen the gap as happens in many capitalistic countries. We have to find the middle way. Shuli, tell our audience about your background, how you became a famous singer during those days in 1967. Well, in 1967, I was uh, a soldier girl. I was not uh, in IDF. I was not running around uh, shooting, but I volunteered to teach Hebrew to newcomers, ladies who came from the Atlas Mountains in Morocco. 
and couldn't read and write in any language. But in my free time, I used to sing and uh, I joined the radio program of amateurs and the daughter of Naomi Shemer happened to, to hear me on the radio program and she called her mother and said, come listen to her, you might like her voice. And Naomi Shemer listened and I think with my voice in the background, she wrote uh, Yerushalayim Shel Zahav, which was supposed to decorate a song contest held in 1967 on the Independence uh, Day. Um, it, was heard, it was held yearly, and uh, the song for Yerushalayim was a request of the legendary late mayor Teddy Kolek, he wanted a song for his Yerushalayim. So she wrote this song, it was outside of the contest, and it was a song of yearning to Jerusalem, to the places that we cannot reach because the city was divided in two. And little did we know that two and a half weeks later, the city would be united and we would be able to go to the holy places that are so dear to us. So the song has become like a prophecy come true. And uh, with the six, it was, uh, it became the hymn of the Six Day War and even uh, suggested to be the new hymn for Israel. Okay, we do respect Hatikva, but it comes only second after Hatikva till this day. And I was so fortunate and blessed to receive the song from Naomi Shemer. How very interesting. I didn't know that. So actually, she was so impressed with your voice that she wrote the song, You Shall I'm Shall I Have, Jerusalem of Gold, due to you. Uh, no, she wrote it because Mayor Teddy Kolek asked for a song for Jerusalem. But she had the idea that I will perform it. How very that, interesting. That she will give me the song. Yes. And just and I was totally unknown. Right, then. this is true. And just you and the guitar. Yes. You recorded your own guitar accompaniment. Yes, right. How I beautiful that was. Yes, so powerful, so beautiful, that song. Um, so other than Nomi Shema's wonderful song, Jerusalem of Gold, and so many others, Machar, Tomorrow, yes. The Wish for Peace, what other songs in particular do you like? I like a lot uh, Rabbi Shlomo Karlebach songs and the uh, songs I told you about. I do like a lot, lots of uh, Naomi Shemer songs like Lu Yehi, Choshat Eucalyptus. Um, I like Sephardi songs. Ir Mekero Madre Beautiful, surely. I'd like to ask you to tell us about your plans for the future and are you doing a lot of touring right now in America and elsewhere? Well, uh, I concentrate mainly on the present time <laughs> and I do continue singing. Luckily, I feel myself lucky that I can uh, still sing and bring the message of uh, positive Israel to whoever wants to listen. I sing a lot in Israel and I tour the United States quite often. And I plan to continue this as long as I can. Surely it's been really a privilege and a pleasure to have you on the Shalom Show. We need to thank do this again sometime. Thank you very much and thank you for having me on the Shalom Show. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. I'll be right back.
This brings us to the end of our special show produced on location in Atlanta. I'm Maya Paritz. Thank you for being with us. <laughs>